So mm-hmm. every shampoo that ever existed before the natural hair movement was dishwashing liquid. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, those shampoos always made all these different claims that it did this, that, and the other. They all had sulfates in it, which are in dishwashing liquid. And all they did was replace them with natural sudsing agents. Now, if it bubbles, lathers, and suds, it's still stripping away oil. Much needed oil for textures that are naturally drier. Black women don't right. need the suds in. Your hair is not flat, straight, and greasy. It grows out of your head with volume already, mm-hmm. and it needs moisture. Mm-hmm. Yet the only time you condition it is when you strip it with something that was meant for her hair texture. Her. It's so funky. <laughs> In a world where deception and power rules, one brave woman answers the call of the people. I think I'm gonna run for office. And ventures to the nation's capital to bring a trusted voice to the halls of democracy. I mean, if I ran, do you think you would vote for me? Yeah. It depends. Oh. oh, it depends. Oh. I came through because I wanted to get some insight from some folks who are already on the inside. And uh, oh, yeah. needed here. <laughs> no one is going to believe me in this. You know what? You never told me. What are you running for? The question really is, what are we running to? I'm running to the people. Ooh. <laughs> How well do you think you know government? I went to school. I can answer a couple questions. How are you fighting the colonization? Are you doing martial arts? <laughs> <laughs> if I were in any office, from alderman to state senator to Republican, I'm like, what Satan just flew into the my Santa's mouth? The Santa came in here, right? That's what and happened. Just, uh, that. In Amanda We Trust, an unapologetically political comedy doc from Amanda Seals, coming soon to the internet. Hear that motorcade? That's Kamala going home. That could be me. In AmandaWeTrust.com. Okay, y'all, you see the Afro was Afroing, okay? The flows was flowing. The tresses was tressing. Which is because the episode that we're about to do right now is with Anthony Dickey of Hair Rules. He literally flew to LA just to cut my hair for this project so that I can have a proper afro. Now that's love, and that's a hairstylist love, okay? Now if you wanna see the afro throwing, you know what you gotta do. You gotta go to inamandawetrust.com, all right? If you wanna make sure that you don't miss out on anything, head over there now, drop your email in, you're gonna get an email on the day of the release so that you don't miss out. Because remember, we're only gonna have this project up for two weeks at inamandawetrust.com. Hopefully you'll come through, you'll support, and show your love to this independently produced, unapologetically political comedy documentary from yours truly in amandabetrust.com. See you there. Welcome to another episode of Small Doses Podcast. You know, I have to just pat myself on the back real quick because I just feel like the the episodes just keep getting better. We keep giving the people what they want, the conversations. We've been doing this show, this podcast for five years and now we're getting repeats. Okay, we're getting folks that are coming back. Okay, and they're coming back with more conversations, with more experiences, with more knowledge and wisdom and insights. Part twos and things. Yes, I like to think that small doses basically provides bottom line understanding, mm. but with respect to intellect. Mm-hmm. It's like you giving people the simple without making them feel basic. Yeah, and you know you're talking about what people want. You talk about what you know about. You do. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Listen, talk people. about what you know about. So we have another repeat. Today we are joined by hairstylist, entrepreneur, Thank you. and innovator extraordinaire, Anthony Dickey of Hair Rules and hey, more. Hey, you know. <laughs> What's this hand? I What's know. This? I know. I was trying to do. <laughs> Hey. Hey. Now, before you even interject, I just have to set some things up. First of all, Dickie was here back in 2020, top of 2020. He did side effects of hair. and Before it went all went down. Before, before the panini, yeah. the panorama, the Panasonic. Um, and also before there were changes in your business, in your company, etc. cetera. Um, Dickie is a dear friend of mine. 
And in like a multitude of ways. Mm -hmm. Like not only did I uh, get my first real haircut at Hair Rules. Because I had haircuts, but I got my first yeah. real cut at Hair Rules. You also taught me how to do my hair. Like how to care for my hair, how to understand my hair, like how to respect my hair, which you've done for many, many women. I'm not special in that regard. Jordy, settle. <laughs> Why how does all I that not bother me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> because I've just, we became, we bonded. However, I also had my first and only solo art show at oh, the right. Salon. That was the first one? That was the first and last one. Oh, Hey. Yes, like I've done group shows with people, but I literally did my first and only solo art show at Hair Rules because the art was really focused on hair. And so it just made sense to do it in a salon. And you literally let me do it in your salon for no, like I didn't have to pay or anything. It was just no. love. I don't, you know, me and that pay thing, I don't, you don't have to charge no, nothing for nothing except when it's time to. So for me... Having a salon and it was for me, it was like, you know, even the branding of a salon was like, okay, what is it? It's a place for community, education, and expression. That's what a salon is. If you talk about community, then that's what it is. And so anyone that has ever asked, say, oh, can we do this at the salon? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, how much are you? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you used like, to have people like selling yeah. their, their <laughs> knit wares and, you know. Yeah. But I think that that especially in this day and age where everybody is like trying to get hit a lick for everything. Yeah, no, that never worked. And it didn't. And, and I've, and I've benefited from just always saying yes to everything. And that, when I say, when I mean saying yes to everything, it's, it's not overworking yourself. It's just saying yes to everybody about everything because they have a hard time saying yes to themselves or believing mm. that there are openings and possibilities and opportunities and, and opportunities are everywhere. People just don't see them or are too distracted by other things. So for me to say yes is also a commitment to my community. I mean, that's the beginning. Okay. So that, that lets you know where we're already starting yeah. from. We're dealing with somebody who has a commitment to the community to our community. Now, I have shown pictures and video of Dickie doing my hair before on the Instagram. <laughs> and y'all, some, some of y'all have come out your face and been like, of course you'd have a white man doing uh, your hair. Yeah, yeah. You know, at a glance, I do look like a white man, but I'm not a white man. <laughs> you can kiss my whole red. <laughs> but you know what? When I wrote Hair Rules, the book, which is now it's in its 20 year anniversary. <laughs> Um, a woman reviewed it. Remember, because there were before blogs, there were chat rooms. Yes, and that is really where the natural hair movement uh, was was uh, founded and 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 um, um, found itself because it was a place where women could go share their stories, yes. right? Um, and this woman wrote a two page review on the book on my hair rules book. She was a specialist. She was a black woman that was specialized in long hair for black women. I'm like, okay, that's a good one. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, and she reviewed the she reviewed my book based off of the fact that I under the assumption that I was a white man. I was and I don't really care about what you that you think of whether I'm white or black. I don't. I'm I'm black. I'm half I'm actually technically half white and half black, but I my I was raised by my black family. And I don't know any my mom passed when I was uh three and she was the last white person I knew. <laughs> in my family. And that was in Oklahoma or Seattle? No, it was in Seattle. Okay. Where my family's from Oklahoma because my family's all from Oklahoma. Okay. I'm first I was like, generation. I was, I was like, oh, I was associate Oklahoma. And with only you. dawned on me a few years ago, I was like, oh, my dad, because my grandparents were sharecroppers in my, and if you had, in order to leave home back in the day, you either had to um, get married or you could follow a sibling who had gotten married. Um, because it was like, otherwise, you got to stay and pick cotton. So my dad and uncles followed my aunt. That's the story of my family trying to mix it up, right? I, that's the one I'm going with. My dad and uncle followed my aunt who got married to a guy in the service. And he got stationed in Bremerton, Washington. So somehow they made it to Seattle. And it only dawned on me a few years ago. I was like, my dad must have been buck wild when not only he could realize that he could, like, uh, have he could talk to a white woman, but he could have relations with her. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the result of that, and right? <laughs> Paul Dickey. the result Dickie. of that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I digress. So this episode is called oh. Side Effects of Textured Hair. 
because of a multitude of reasons that allow us to go on the journey that you have gone on that in many ways has been informed by your involvement in this whole like textured hair yeah. movement, et cetera, the expansion beyond that. And I think there's just a lot of interest that so many black women just have that's really grounded in the way that our identity is attached to the fact that we have textured hair, yeah, right? Like yes. it's not in a way that white women can't relate. And it's fairly new. You think- to, a, to many generations, yeah. Hmm. I, it's it, you know, it's twenty years ago, the natural hair movement kind of launched, right? With like hair the was neo 20, soul, yeah. I feel right. Well, with supermodels got replaced by celebrities. Okay. On the covers of all the major magazines that we know of, right? And now you could really you could delve into the lives of celebrities and find out what because they were working on. You could sell units. You know, record labels was like, I can get we can get more PR if we if we put her on the cover. Right. And the magazines could sell more issues if they got into the personal lives of celebrities. And but see, like under like the f- few supermodels, which were Tyron and Naomi mm-hmm. and a f- and a few others. I like Weck. Alec Weck. Who follows me and comments often oh, on right my on. Instagram. Hey, Alec. And, <laughs> yeah, she's a uh, love Alec. Um, that you couldn't change how a celebrity came to the table looking if they were selling units like Mary J. Blige. So we started to see the, the images or, or Jill Scott or Erica mm-hmm. Badu, which kind of women, black women could see different images of themselves beyond the usual weaves or, you know, or covers that donned straight hair. Because weaves were still very prevalent. Um, right. And really the neo-soul thing and the celebrity shift to magazines and units and selling 2.5, 2.5 million subscribers a month, like all the Condé, Ma- Condé Nast magazines, women just started seeing in it different images of themselves. And so like you have to meet them where they are. If when you see the industry changing, you change with it. And so that's where the natural hair movement kind of started, right? Before before there were blogs, there were chat rooms, long hair care forum, um, and women could share stories. And so, how does that connect? Like they were sharing stories about what though? About how, like, girl, my hair, my natural hair is 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 beautiful, and this is some of the things that I've been told about it. Was and this related to also like the deci- the the d de- the distancing from perming? Yeah. Because I feel like it all happened kind of well, simultaneously. Well, that was, yeah. To your point, we first started hearing terms like no edges and my stress spot. Um, <laughs> when, at a you know, in the, what, 80s and 90s? That's the first time those those terms were ever used for black really? women in their hair. Before that, the first stature of movement started in the 60s and 70s. Of course. Right, out of a fight for civil rights and, and the proudest of, and the enormity of one's afro. Hey. And the pride and all that. Um, so there was, but then some might argue that through affirmative action, particularly people, when people of color, particularly women, could get a higher education and move into corporate America. Yes. And no black woman was going to trust a Sunday press and 60% chance of rain <laughs> and then white people's job. <laughs> no, and all that education. She wasn't doing it. So be relaxers in the 80s became really convenient. Yeah. Weaves, micro braids, things that you could put in your hair and put away and not have to think about her at all and go do your live your best life in corporate America and 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 and, and rise up as, as as much as they let you. But you see what I'm the natural evolution of what we were doing when there was time to do and spend yes. nobody sat in between nobody's legs for sixteen hours getting no braids you got your hair done once a week you got talked about if you had fuzzy funky braids <laughs> right they didn't there weren't there weren't styles that la- that lasted for yeah, three months at a time they weren't sustainable they were not they didn't last for three months at a time and they that was were, because of the the synthetic hair wasn't able to no it's just that doing hair back in the in the 70s and 80s i mean the early 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 80s or mm-hmm. late 70s you had time to do, you know, you, you weren't getting your hair pressed because... Well, women couldn't even have jobs like that. Right. So I see what you're so saying. So when you got your hair pressed, you got your hair pressed for a certain occasion. Yes. Black people are the most conservative people on earth. And so you got your hair pressed for a special occasion, not because you were assimilating into a white standard of beauty. You did it for a special occasion. And nobody had heat-damaged afros back then because you wore afro when your, per- when your press sweated out. And then you occasionally, again, got braids. 
long, elaborate braids with beads even. Yes. And not a lot of hair added, but everybody had a beautiful, healthy hair. Right. Until that shift in corporate America. Mm. And, 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 and I've never heard those two things correlated, but mm-hmm. it makes perfect sense. It does make perfect sense. Think about the timing of it all. And so this now new natural hair journey that happened. Girl. Let the right. river run. Let all the tree. <laughs> Maybe a short, tight, natural. But nobody was rocking this at that time. Right. And I mean, like Jameson, it was, like Judith Jameson had the short, tight, natural because she was putting on an astronaut helmet. Right. <laughs> like, I feel like the short, exactly. tight, natural was like, the, but you're right. It wasn't really a fro. It was a short tight, just long enough to say I'm feminine. Mm-hmm. That was the vibe. Yeah. So then we get into the 80s and 90s. I mean, we get into the 90s and we start to see. No, a we're l- still we're still doing perms. We're still doing perms. But late problems, 90s is when we start seeing problems with no edges and hair loss. Yes. You know, it was even it was you were it was you know everybody had somebody had a joke about somebody's edges, mm-hmm. and that just was never a thing prior to that 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 period. And so for me, wow. why I wrote Hair Rules was because you could just see the evolution of things and how they were changing. And I'm like, and, you know, I didn't I have no interest in writing a book besides the fact that Sam Fine, um, one of my comrades in fashion and beauty, Kevin Aquan. Um, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Um, and Kevin Mancuso, um, one of my a hairdressers that I assisted and learned a lot from. Mm-hmm. Um they they had all written books and I looked through them and I was like, okay. Particularly the hair ones. I was like, that's not completely accurate because she has a weave, so you can't really describe her hair texture, Naomi, as being medium, fine, whatever, whatever. Mm. And I was like, I'm gonna write a book. Well, Dickie, what you gonna write a book about? I'm just gonna tell the truth. I'll tell the truth what beauty Bibles, all the mo- particularly condonas. Um, publications which you now feature black models or women of color on all the covers, you know, and they don't sell 2.5 million subscribers and they're all digital. Right. Had you knew who was reading your magazine, you might still be in business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, <laughs> um, and and cosmetologist who were telling women crazy things about their hair. And those magazines usually call up the middle guy, which is our editorial hairstylist like myself at the time, and get quotes from them about stories that they were writing to keep up with the quota of 2.5 million subscribers a month and telling a story every freaking month that was different from the last one. And hairdressers, there's no there, you know, in order to get a license to do hair, there was no mention of the word kinky or curly in any textbook across the globe. We've talked about that. No, but I mean, so you look notice, at the perspective. You notice that even now, as like you were still in a situation where like white hairstylists really feel like learning how to do black hair is. You mean kind that of, corny curly cut they be talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that fake haircut. I mean, it just feels like it's a it's a um, it's like an extracurricular, you know? Yeah. It's not, it's not, it, learning how to do textured hair for a lot of white stylists is simply just something that you learn because you had extra time or extra Well, interest. just like they like booties and lips. They're learning to do, na- they're learning to do a little more natural hair now. Uh, it's, it's, it's changing. It's, it's not as, it's not as desolate as it was before. Everybody's learning how to do everything right now. That's oh, a I great thing about where we are. But yeah, no, but they are. It, it, it before it was just it wasn't it wasn't possible um, culturally. It wasn't possible. It wasn't possible because nobody was seeing our culture as being anything desirable when it mm. came and beauty. It's like okay, and now we're finding that you know they're that you know they love us. Well, they don't love us, but they love our. That's what I mean. <laughs> as uh, as I. I've read this quote and I've said it and people... Attri- and we're also people, very people, inspiring people. People attribute this quote yes. to me, but it's not my quote. But basically, they want our rhythm, but not our blues. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's an accurate statement. But um, grace has me to believe and hope has me to believe that we inspire. Okay. 
I mean, we, we inspire in, theft. We ins- <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> You like know it, what? because you know what it doesn't it's 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 one thing to say like we inspire like when you say inspire to me I feel like that means it inspires me to then act on my own it inspires me mm-hmm. to then create on my own it inspires me to be curious but I think you know a lot of times no I we, just mean from a purpose driven life experience and 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 that our our goal here whatever it is you're supposed to be doing is to inspire people to do and be better whether you whether you decide to or not i don't care but you should be <laughs> catching this catching these vibes catch the vibes yeah so you caught the vibe and, uh, and if you're not i'm not like you I'm yeah with you. yeah we don't have time so you caught the vibe that textured hair was not being considered and, you and I were didn't one look of, at it as textured hair. I, I stopped using the term textured hair. But I don't want to get there yet. But, okay, how did you, right. but you started using it. Yes. And you created entire. See, I've already flipped it. I'm already <laughs> there. So it's hard for me to go back. But go ahead. Well, we have to. I, I want to take the journey. Yes, I appreciate it. <laughs> this is what happens when you interview people that you know and love. They're like, you already know the answer to this. Why are we talking about this to these people? No, but I also learn patience from women. And so I need to learn how to shut the hell up. <laughs> you know, listen. So when did you create the category mm. of textured hair? Because you didn't just come into this as a as a hairdresser. Yeah. You came into this as an entrepreneur because the product, yes. and, and you were telling me this off camera earlier, but like, I didn't realize that like, it's really about the product for a lot of folks in the hair game. It's not about just being at the salon. Mm, yes. Is that not true? No. Okay. I misunderstood. For me, it was about, it was about all the moving components of, 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 of helping women to rediscover their natural texture Okay. and not excluding straight as a texture. Okay. And how do I do that? And also serve, not not even also serve. What happened was that that was my goal, but who came out of the woodwork happened to be the women who had a hair texture that was most underserved. And and I opened it was and and so I started with her. And who was that? That was women with kinky curly textures, which is on the scale that I feel is racist. Uh huh. <laughs> what would that be on the scale? Um, okay. Well, you know, I've heard this argument for some time. <laughs> it could be a one, but uh, but but one, but straight hair is a one. I went with the grading system from Andre Walker, and whoever decided to adopt that that um, loves it and likes it um, as kinky being the four and subtext sub types of hair like a b or c and so it was four for kinky uh three for curly two for wavy and one for straight and you could argue whatever you whether you think that it's why you think it's racist might be because of the order in numbers i didn't get that far beside before looking at what was useful about this tool for me to help teach and show women what your hair texture is not and what it should be and could be if you was if and more, and finding a more customized texture specific approach so you could see what you don't have but what you can have based off of a re- finding a regimen that was specific to your texture so healthy hair is not some cliche that i make up it's really about keeping your hair health your hair healthy well and and then embracing the fact that kinky or curly textures were the most versatile textures mm I don't think people really feel that way. Yeah, it's the funnest thing because when you see a texture that has nothing but body, all you're are trying to do if you were to jump into the hair business and start doing straight hair in white salons was building volume. And these textures already had volume. But they just happened to be naturally drier. And then historically, they weren't thinking about us when they made products or education. So... Just rethink how all this is supposed to work instead of reinventing the wheel and 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 and, and come up with a customized approach to what one hair texture needs and what the other one does not. 
I will tell you this. Yes. I do feel like once I learned that this whole texture map was created by a black hairstylist, yeah. that did start me to feel a little less like, oh, this is racist. I could totally see now that you say, because I'm open to it, I'm because you're my friend, but I'm not open to a lot of and so when you say it like that, I can totally see. So, so Andre, so this is the other thing. What the, what, what, what cosmetology score, what the industry produces is hairdressers that either do one texture yes. or the other based off of their ethnicity. Facts. And I happen to fall into a unique category mm -hmm. of somebody where my grandfather said, son, my cousin, my cousins would tease me, tease me that, you know, I didn't know how to twirl these irons and this, that, and the other. I was like, yeah, but you just relaxed her hair and then you put that that twirling <laughs> wad into a stove and, like, wasn't it already straight? <laughs> <laughs> so, and they would tease me and my grandfather would say, son, all money is green money. Go get that white money. Oh, and so Lord. I worked in white salons because that's where the money was. It was not, I mean, it made more sense, right? Because um, I wanted it, to get paid. But it allowed you to become versatile. Yeah. And so, and then from my family and learning my hair texture and their hair texture and watching some of the things that they did, it was like, oh, what's, what you do to, has nothing to do with, oh, okay. And so it was just that, those aha moments and, you know, open your eyes to the whatever industry you're in to see how it runs and works before it's, before it's saying, I want to do that. Because you don't know how it works. And I, and, I, and I discovered after so many years how the beauty industry worked mm. and who they were talking to and how, how, how um, incorrect a lot of the information was and, um, and segregated and racist that it was. Subconsciously, it's a you know, it's it's beauty. It's What's so trippy though is that the like you said, the space that you had once you came into the space of like, okay, I want to help women understand their hair, mm -hmm. and it just ended up that the majority of the women that were coming to you um, were the most underserved, right? Well, after I wrote my book, Hair Rules, mm -hmm. because my clientele was 90, 95, 98 percent white prior to writing the book, Hair what? Rules, and then Hair Rules changed. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I was discovering some things because I did all the white, mo all the black models, uh, supermodels in the late 90s, like Tamiko Frazier, who wrote the foreword to the book. She mm -hmm. was Mar Maybelline's first African-American spokesmodel with a multi-million dollar contract. Mm -hmm. All her hair fell out after the she signed the contract from the weave. Oh, my God. Because, you know, they, she would get touch-ups while the weave was in the hair. Uh-huh. And keep the weave in for like three months at a time because that was the thing. And nobody taking a weave out in like a month. I distinctly remember Mashonda uh, when she was with Swiss. I distinctly remember her when she was with Swiss and she was performing uh, because she was pursuing a recording like career. And she was like, yeah. I remember she was, we were supposed to get up and she was like, oh, I have to go get my weave done because I'm going on tour for three months, and I'm not trying to do my hair. And I right. remember, and I didn't have, an, I didn't have experience with weave. And I just remember saying to myself, like, I didn't even know you could do yeah. that. But that's not healthy, is it? Mm -mm. Three months is an excessive amount of time for your hair to be roped up into a one situation. I thought that is the best way. I'm, and that's, I couldn't have heard it any better word because I tell this story to my clients every day. I love that. I got to hear. Oh, I can't wait. Yes. Wrapped up into a whole thing for like three months. It's like, like, can we stop also, normalizing you're, you're dirty hair? But you also have like hair follicles yeah. that your hair I mean, goes out of. It's they hygiene. need to breathe. It's hygiene. Are y'all listening? So this scalp here, this skin here is the same skin that's here. <laughs> It's the same skin. He's patting his armpits. I don't care how <laughs> much you scrub a dub loofah in the shower with all the soap you want every single day or twice a day. This the scalp is skin too. And mm. the hair usually is the most driest thing on your body, but it won't get wet or conditioned. So think about that. I mean, you know. Right. You know, so so that's where that's where that's where I think my category came in with was one. No, I, I I'm saying that all wrong. Um, 
that was where the most underserved textures and education was needed. Um, because I just came from a place where like I watched my cousins who I adored get their hair done and they were fine. I was like, they were so beautiful. They were teenagers. It was the seventies. I was like five or six and it was four of them and, or, or my cousin and sissy and just to watch them do their hair and like they got their hair pressed occasionally. Then they wore afros. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, we you know, wore halter tops and sh jean shorts and ate a peach with a little salt on it and <laughs> ate around the thing and watched stories and stuff. And I was just like, <laughs> I was followed them everywhere. But, you know, watching women. So I've been watching women in their whole beauty regimen forever. So I was like, there's no reason why any black woman should be having problems with her hair. That's awful. Yeah. Because that's not what I experienced growing up. Right. Um. And it's, you know, some of my, one of my cousins, she relaxed her hair till she, she stopped relaxing it finally because it did so much damage to her scalp. It's chemical. I'm not, and I'm not saying her name because that's my sister's. Um, but, you know, it's like. Did you like, tell her to stop? No, she knew to stop. <laughs> Don't say nothing to me when we get home. <laughs> But she's on a trip right now, so. So where do you then go after you create hair, after you write hair rules? Oh, okay. The audience, I mean, not the audience, but your your clientele shifts. Yeah. And, you know, you become somewhat of a guru. And I was, I was troubleshooting. So as that shift was happening, that's where I really found... I knew my purpose was every... Was, 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 was to wake up every day and to be... Um, and, and it was one person at a time. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, wow, that's perfect doing hair, right? But I really found my purpose when it was just like, I, was, I would listen to these stories. And I knew that it was important for women who were coming to me to listen to their story. Because I learned a lot and I learned how to communicate um, by listening to someone's story about their hair and their, their hair journey. And so it helped me to form a certain unique type of consultation. Um, which took women back to their first relaxer and or their first experience with their hair. Um, and so I just learned a lot. Um, and I got a wealth of information and they left with a wealth of information. And that's what they came to me for. So. But what part of this story are we leaving out? Huh? Because you've had a life. You've had a journey. And I feel like we're leaving things out. Oh, definitely. I mean, consumer packaged goods, the beauty space. You know, when you're when you're a pioneer and you're creating a category based off of texture, mm -hmm. not the archaic, ethnic specific approach to the you know, Pantene Pro V. <laughs> yeah, you you shop down this aisle and you shop down that aisle. Like, well, that's like you know, you go drink out of this water fountain and you drink out of that water fountain. Ooh. Right? I mean, we used to have old dusty brand the shelf in some random drugstore. You ain't never lie, bro. And then our, you know, and all and all they did was repark repackage and remarket her stuff and put it in our aisle. And said it was for naturally or dry hair, relaxed hair, color treated hair. It was the same different bottle. And so why launch a line of products where there wasn't education behind it? The book, right? The mm -hmm. book, the products, because the products were never thought of um, when I wrote the book. And so through all of that, when you start a business, when you're an entrepreneur, through the ups and downs, nobody knows unless you tell them, it's rough. It's really rough. I remember when I found out that, um, I think it's Miko. Miko from um, Miss Jessie's. Had unalived herself. Took her, sell her life. Um, my mom took her life too. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, I identified with it, with her, with, I identified with her pain. I don't know what her pain was, but at the time I was going through hair rules, a rough, tumultuous time with hair rules. Um, and it was really inspiring to be black owned. Yeah. You know, because our angel investor, who is black, he's Greek, but I'm sorry. <laughs> His wife, my BFF, she's she's a halfy. So together we was a black person. <laughs> the math. 
was mathing. Um, the math was mathing, and I was so proud. Like I was, but I was like, oh, like we are also on for the, all the taxes owed, and you know, it's like there were liens being slipped under the door, and the you know thirty thousand dollars due by Monday. I was like, oh, <laughs> um, and we paid all of it. We paid all of it. We paid all of our taxes um, uh, to the tune of maybe two hundred thousand dollars worth of back taxes. Um, re re uh, kind of calibrated. No, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, you uh, you ain't got to ever worry about me owing you nobody money because I don't owe nobody no money. Okay, not for a minute. Um. And you know, it was a it was a rough time. And I had a few partners. I now have my partners or my family. Um, what was that transition like? Deciding to say, you know, what we're going to keep it in the family. Um, it was easy because my family would do anything for me. Wow, not everybody can say that. Not everybody can say that. No, I know. I can't. Say I'm that. blessed. I can't say that. My mama, yes. My aunt, I can maybe. send a text and say, please help. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And I'm like, whoa, but that's, but my that's, family's like that. <laughs> All they are. That's a beautiful thing. They didn't, they don't judge me, you know. And I've never had a problem. I've never had, I've never had many problems, right? And I developed an addiction to pain pills to make me smile. And who did you feel like you needed to smile for? Um, me. Like, not nobody else. <laughs> like you just wanted to. Yeah. I just okay. wanted to not be stressed and worried and down and like stressed. Yo. What was stressing you out? Oh, my God. Like that we. How was this? Like when. So when your business has several near death experiences and only you're you're the only one that knows because the public doesn't know. Right. You don't know if it's going to end or not. And, you know, the brand, the product is called Hair Rules. And I wrote a book called yeah, Hair Rules. it's yours. And it's by Anthony Dickey. Yeah. So even, you know, it, may, it would make, it probably would have made sense when, um, when Peter, um, my original and only angel investor, um, God bless his soul, for believing in me. Um, he was very generous with my equity. Oh wow. It, it, yeah, it was a beautiful it was a beautiful deal. Um and you know, it was family. But um you know, it's just a lot of a lot of I don't know, the patients and the patients in ICU. And so, you know, I I've gone through an iteration of partners and but you know, the person who on the low low nodes is on, the one that only suffered the losses were me in terms of like emotionally like okay the patients there's no there's yeah, no pulse we're like we're done the jolt yeah we're done beep and then but you're not is there a sense of relief <sighs> though for a second when it's done when you feel no. like it's done or is it a sense of failure failure okay there's been certain times where I feel like I'm I'm like something's not gonna work and there's a yeah. there's a there's a I remember when I was getting kicked out of the the acting program at SUNY Purchase and I was like on the ground like crying like uh -huh. despair you know <laughs> and I was like, Devon no and I was like what am I gonna do what am I gonna do and there was a little person in the back of my head that was like you ain't wanna do this. <laughs> <you go." laughs> I was just gonna say that's all <laughs> exactly because you knew. And wasn't that important in the back Little that's voice. different from now right you, you ain't want to do this right anyway. right so the other thing is that the older you get the stakes are higher Psh, facts facts so i'm like you know i'm 58 now i was 40 something when this started really i yeah. think well, what's the math do the math for me is it tw how many years um it's like 15. No, 2000. If it's 15, then that, then you well, were. It's 20 years I wrote the book, but that's not a part that that I can't say that that was um that was the Well, 58 issue. minus 15 is 43. Isn't it? Right. So <laughs> Y'all know I don't do math. Quick, give me an analogy. You want what a metaphor? Was I can do a haiku. What was 2007? 
When was 2007? How many years ago was that? 2007. Now subtract that from my age. Do please, the math, y'all. Please help me. Do the math, <laughs> y'all, and get back to me. But that's not that important as much. Um, oh, yeah. And then you get, you, then you reach, then your body ages. 16 years. Yeah. What is? 2007 was 16 years ago. Damn. That's about to be 22. Yeah. You know, time, <laughs> it just you like. You can't get time back. Like, we just realized it's been 11 years that we've known each other. Like, that's an, ex- like, you've seen me through, like, phases of life. Mm. Like, um, so when you're talking about this for you, yeah. you said that the the pain medication became something that you felt like you needed in order to not feel, like, weighed down by the constant struggle of this, this hair journey. Yeah. Do you, so how did you get over that bridge? What do you mean, how did I get over the bridge? Are you still addicted to painkillers? No, absolutely not. I discovered through having, um, um, I had a severe case of insomnia last April. I'm sorry. I had a a severe case of insomnia last April. Um, And... And I discovered probably a week in, a week after the previous week, probably having, I mean, 72 hours of, of not being able to sleep um, and going to the doctor and like, you know, that I was like, it's those f-ing pills. You really, that's what it, you feel like that's what it was? Oh, I'm sure it was because they were preventing me from over they were preventing me from dealing with normal stressful situations i be, being a business owner i was also the guy even before that i was always the guy who could put out a fire the problem solver i was a problem fixer. solver because i love you people be so Olivia much Pope. what are you just have to get down with people so they feel like they bring herd yeah and that's a and i loved doing that right um and the most, in the, in the, in the, at the worst of times, the people's, you know, spiraling mm-hmm. out of control and coming unhinged. I was like, what happened? Oh, we got, we got to fix that for you right now. I was that guy. Right. And I started to see that diminish. And I couldn't do it. And I would cringe at, uh, I would cringe and have a little bit of anxiety under, under just a normal stressful situation. So I was like, mm, this is not going to go well. And one pill a week turned into one pill a day. Large doses. Not to be confused. <laughs> Small doses. Small doses <laughs> turned into large dosage. Not the kind that like I be hearing people saying, because my system is weak, because I don't I can't take much of anything, right? <laughs> and that's a good that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Um now do you have an addictive personality? Uh yes. Cigarettes. Oh. And so I've stopped, I stopped, I smoked for about 30 years and I stopped. Um, for about ten, and then I went back, and I go back like who goes every back? who goes back. That is nasty. <laughs> so it's awful because I don't. Awful. It smells nasty. It tastes nasty. It gives you headaches and shit, and I have no tolerance for pain to begin with. And I'm that brother who needs nine hours and a nap. So not sleeping for me has been traumatic, but also age and. Uh, um, hormone levels because guys have horm- guys have hormone stuff too. Y'all just don't know it, or you'll talk about it, or don't know enough about your bodies the way I have been forced um, to learn. Forced to learn through women to, to sit down and tell me all this stuff. <laughs> I've heard it all. But so have you, you tried? Have you tried like holistic approaches? Yes, you- I'm a holistic. I was raised by a bunch of. After leaving home, I was um, lucky enough in San Francisco um, to have been um, raised by a bunch of acid-taking, holistic, harmonic convergence, vegetarian queens who taught me about health and eating right. And um, you know, Do you feel like your brain is racing when you're trying to go to sleep? No. So it's literally just your body is not It's just it's the, the mechanism to go to sleep doesn't turn on. Fascinating. Also terrible. Awful. The mechanism to go to sleep doesn't turn on. And you're waiting for it to turn on and it won't. 
Oh, Dickie. Yeah. So you, so I I discovered this last year through um through practice, um, mental and um, physical wellness for me couldn't be seasonal anymore, and I had to I had to live a life of wellness. Um, and discover and understand. I've discovered like how CBD works and CBN, mm-hmm. um, and a little bit of melatonin, um, but it's still hit or miss. You see how hair be stressing us the f- out, yeah, <laughs> like, right? Like literally, your your working within the hair industry has like stripped you of of being able to sleep well at night. That is just. I don't I don't think hair. Well, yeah, I think it's more than hair. For me, it's more than hair. It's business. It's business. Working within the hair industry, like yeah. working within this industry. I think because ultimately what I what I when I when I envisioned talking to you again about this, it was like this space that you like have created has become so huge now this textured hair conversation is no longer just individuals in a chat room sharing their experience right like i mean it's a booming billion trillion dollar industry yes um and and hair rules i don't feel like gets enough um attention like i like hair rules are the products that i use like well the good news about that is that there is a wealth of consumers out there waiting to use hair rules that don't know about it (laughs) That's how I have to see that. Um, I was excited about that because, you know, it's when we first started, like, we were in Ulta, Walgreens, um, Ulta, Walgreens, Target, Beauty Brands, um, Ricky's, right? We were in all those places. Yes, you were. Yeah. And then we came out. The decision when the strategy became um, not an affordable strategy, when we took the brand over, um, we were like, quickly come out of mass because that is not an affordable strategy. Oh. And we went back to a smaller kind of e-commerce based approach, which is an affordable approach, right? Okay. Um, because, you know, if the worst thing that happens if your brand is great is that they, you know, it sells and you got to come up with more money to make more products. People don't get that part. Right. Like you, you can make out, you can make something that people really love, but if you don't have the capital to produce the goods <laughs> that people love, you can't make any money. So but you might choose the wrong strategy. It, doesn't selling it, doesn't selling a large quantity of it create the capital to be able to produce more? No, not necessarily because you got to wait for a check. And those big box retailers aren't serving up checks every month just like that. Mm. Right. And you also have to put advertising and marketing dollars into the, that strategy that you wouldn't normally have to put in because that's the strat- that's the strategy you show- you chose. And so we ushered in the whole category of well my least favorite term multicultural um category in Target um and yeah the multicultural category in one Target. of my least favorite terms it's such an empty term it's like no call what does to that even it's mean? like no call to action <laughs> the multicultural category. Right. I mean, I do feel like there's there's a new kind of excitement about hair and there's like still new styles being created. I mean, I love seeing like Halle Bailey as the little mermaid. Yeah. But she's got like goddess locks and you know, I, I saw- think you're happy. I think you're happy about what was achieved through the natural hair movement influencing everybody else to love themselves. Cause at the end of the day, it's about personal style. Right. Right. And that you are okay the way you are and put it all on. And change it up however you want to do it without judgment. But please don't have tore up hair. Can you just real quick give people a little tip on what um, what you feel like is the biggest myth about black women's hair that we as black women subscribe to? Oh, <clears throat> um, water dries your hair out. Now just think about that. <laughs> or that your hair might not grow, or that your hair doesn't grow as quickly as any white woman would would hair down to the back of her knees. Well, why isn't our hair growing as fast? What? 
Because I feel like I white say, girls' hair. No. I feel like white girls' hair is just constantly growing. They're constantly getting it cut. Like it's always like my hair is so it's growing. It's like it has. I have to go to Fantastic Sam's. Because you're still bringing over those same ideals about hair care that wasn't for your hair texture. There were all regiments that were specific to maintaining styles that you kept for weeks and months at a time. And natural hair is naturally drier. Yes. And it wants water. And water never dried anything out <laughs> or made anything dirty. Where you do we use get that from? Because it's really the alcohol. The, it's really the alcohol in the product that's what drying water it out, to do right? With alcohol. No, I'm saying it's really the water. It's really the alcohol in the products that are being used when you're washing your hair. Alcohol that, and products are great for women with straight hair, but because, I know that, Dickie. Listen with the guys. Okay. What I'm saying. Okay, okay. What I'm saying is that I think a lot of black women for a long time we did not have products for our hair texture. Right? We were using alcohol-based shampoos and conditioners for that white girls have to strip the grease, but we don't got that grease issue the way they do. So mm -hmm. we were, even when we would wash our hair, we would use those products and it would dry it out because it's the alcohol in those products drying it out. No, the detergents. It's the detergents. Yeah, the alcohol was, so alcohol is, is how, what it does is it, 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 uh, it strips away oil and moisture. Right. So does detergent. Okay. Right, and detergents are generally in shampoos that bubble, lather, and suds that do that make it look like they're working, right? Sure. Because that's what I think. A lot of a lot of people didn't feel like these things were working unless you were getting this whole lather and the the busyness of that. And I know that you. I remember you literally having to tell me like you're going to use a cream shampoo. Right. It's not going to lather. Right. But it you'll is use, effective. Right. But you'll use enough of it to where you feel like your it's hair. It's coated. It's coated and you have something in your hair working and using and being able to sh clean and detangle your hair. That's different from alcohol. Alcohol is usually what they're telling you that you've heard about alcohol being bad is that it's in styling products okay. like sprays, Got it. mousses, yes. which are great for women with flat, straight, greasy hair, because it and is that a one A B C? Yeah. Okay. Ex thank you. You be knowing. <laughs> <laughs> Shampoos that bubble, lather, and suds. So here's the thing. Everybody's heard of sulfate free, right? Yes. Sulfate is a uh, sudsing agent that is in dishwashing liquid. Oh. And in the beginning of the natural hair movement, when the first three no sud shampoo brands that were Devachon No Poo, Wen, and mm -hmm. Hair Rules. Yes. We were the first three no sud shampoos. Okay. And sulfates were a part of a marketing term where it's just like no sulfates in the shampoos. Yes. Right? Because also Devachon, I think, had they had a, a, a low poo. Yes, and, it was and, very right? like vegan. Yeah. You know? I give just... it to them because they, 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 there was education there, but it wasn't for everybody. And so I was like, okay, well, we had a sudsing shampoo that we developed with our line, with no sud shampoo and a sudsing agency, um, which was, and so sudsing agents were um, replaced with natural sudsing agents, sulfates, right? Mm -hmm. So every shampoo that ever existed before the natural hair movement was dishwashing liquid. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, those shampoos always made all these different claims that it did this, that, and the other. They all had sulfates in it, which are in dishwashing liquid. And all they did was replace them with natural sudsing agents. Now, if it bubbles, lathers, and suds, it's still stripping away oil. Much needed oil for textures that are naturally drier. Black women don't right. need the suds in. Your hair is not flat, straight, and greasy. It grows out of your head with volume already, mm -hmm. and it needs moisture. Mm -hmm. Yet the only time you condition it is when you strip it with something that was meant for her hair texture. Her. And now, the whole ideal with... So, so if I were to leave you with two things, or any black woman with two things, is that wash and go styling... Where do you think the term came from? It came from white girls and Latin girls. You've seen your entire life outside with wet, curly hair. Okay. Right? So who knew that a black woman with kinky, curly textures, their hair would benefit from water? Right. And conditioner. Mm-hmm. Daily. As often as you want. Okay. 
so gone is the notion that as a black woman, you can't lead an active lifestyle and run and swim and get in the ocean and this, that, and the other. Right. Well, that only was the case when you got a flat iron situation. Right. And like, if, if you even think about crying, it's going to kink up. Right. But we're talking about rethinking. Yeah. Right. And twist outs and. And then there are, so wash and go styling, depending upon where you are within that texture spectrum, is something that should be done frequently, not infrequently. You're simply incorporating your entire hair care and styling routine into your shower routine. And say you don't want to do a wash and go style. You did a whole week's worth of wash and go style. You know, like this week, I can't feel like, I don't feel like being bothered with my hair. I'm going to do a protective style. All a protective style is any style that doesn't require you to have to wet your hair, which can mean a blowout, a blowout in a ponytail, a twist out, a braid out, a wig, a weave, right? But none, of those, but none of those styles will ever should ever be worn longer than three to four weeks. Say it one more time. None of those styles should ever be worn for longer than three to four weeks because that's about as long as your strands and your scalp can sustain that amount of stress or neglect before we start to hear terms like no edges, hair loss, dry hair, and fungus... And a lot of a lot of things like okay. so and you know and no one needs I to guess. sit and getting their hair weaved or braided for longer than four to five hours. So for every hour you spend on your hair, you should get a week. That's within reason. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, I didn't realize people that I was switch using, it up, girl. I was using synthetic hair, and I started breaking out and having headaches, and I thought it was peanut brittle that was causing it. Like me and Devon was literally like trying to figure it out, and then one day Devon was like, "It's the hair." And I was like, that is preposterous, Devon. It's absolutely not the hair. And then I was on Instagram Live one night and was just like chit-chatting with folks. And I was like, yeah, I've been getting breakouts. So, you know, I think it's from eating um, peanut brittle because they be putting dairy in it. You know, um, my man said he think it's the hair. but <laughs> And they were like, it's the hair. Like the, the, like the, insert, the live was yeah. like, Brrr! and people were like, it's the hair. It's the hair. They have so much mess. In this synthetic hair. So that's another reason why when you're like, you know, don't have it in longer than four weeks. Mm -hmm. If you're using the synthetic stuff, like you are putting that synthetic stuff on your scalp and it's just sitting there. And it's also sitting against your neck. It's sitting against your hair, your face, etc. for four and weeks. And where does it come from? Nobody knows. You know, <laughs> where, where does I it saw, come from? I saw a video where they were treating it and it was like watching them put pesticides on cabbage. Right. A mess. Where does it come from? We don't even know. Like, I don't do relaxers anymore. I, and and by, mind you, I was a, I did a mean relaxer. <laughs> I was, we're, hair rules is not just about natural hair. Um, it was, and, and the book was not about any of that. It was just about how to achieve all those things. But, you know, when you discover and you wake up as a professional and you realize that, um, there is greater harm being done, particularly to black women, um, with a higher rate in fibroids, in uterine right. cancer, and that um, these big uh, beauty conglomerates have, have enough scientists and, and lab techs to know what that was doing to the body and what it was, just like cigarette companies knew um, what, nicotine was doing to people and they had to put warning signs on it they, they knew that we know the fraud and so i chose not to do relaxers there's a you know i love keratins i think they're the most advanced thing in hair in the last 50 years non-formaldehyde keratins well we have some questions before we go the people have questions for anthony dickey about side effects of Hair, of textured hair but y'all know how i go we got to go to the patreon you're trying to get more into this you're trying to be all down with this well baby you got to come over to the amanda verse okay let's 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 do that and it's whacked for anybody to get some gimmick driven haircut called a curly cut when it's just like it's like going to the dentist and getting every other tooth cleaned my hair is not as good as my baby sister but i was but it wasn't as coarse as my older sister and it's three different textures existing on my scalp. Well, focus on yours. <laughs> His book, Hair Rules, is easily one of the best, all caps, books for professionals and consumers alike to truly understand curly hair. Oh, isn't that nice? Uh, that would be accurate. <laughs> Dickie, this has been dope. Do you feel, though, that you 
were honest that you because you were like, I want to I want to share. Do you feel like you did that? Um, yeah, I mean, to the best of my ability, because, you know, a lot of these stories are um, they can go on forever. <laughs> All right. They can. They can. And we don't have a lot of time. Well, I have one last question for you. How do yeah. you feel about this new movement where braiders and, you know, stylists want you to show up with your hair already washed? Oh. Um, well, that's terrible. <laughs> but what I will say is that if you haven't washed your hair in four to six weeks, please don't come to me and have me wash it. I mean, that's because because one, that's neglect. And if your hair is not naturally straight, then it's probably going to be locked up by the time you get to me. And you want to normalize me doing hair that's locked up. And that wasn't the appointment. It wasn't a detangling service, which is what you will get charged if not turned away. Whoop. Now y'all know. But, but that should all be in the in their policies and procedures. And um, yeah, but you should, you know, as, as a rule of thumb, you should be able to go a hairdresser and have full on hair care. And it's an experience. And an experience. It should be an experience, an educational experience. Yes. And a bit of a spa moment. Mm hmm. Well, I am a big fan of hair rules products and I can. I'm a big fan of you. Small doses. <laughs> um, I mean, the Afro on small doses. Yeah. Th well, this color is from you. <laughs> this blonde was from you back when I was blonde. And, um, you know, I will say that by going to Hair Rules and getting my hair colored at Hair Rules, but also getting it, like, um cared for at hair rules it allowed my hair to sustain and people yes. would always tell me wow for for being so blonde your hair is really uh healthy well even when you were doing a lot of insecure and a lot of hairdos yes you were hypersensitive about your hair and that's a your industry is a really difficult industry to navigate through a bunch of hairdressers who may or may not know about anything about your hair texture and so I part of the what part of what I do is help women to not only rediscover their hair texture, but come up with language yes. and a scenario on yes. how to deal with hairdressers. And how if to they run into it because I'm not always there. Yeah. And the biggest request that I get is like, um, can you recommend? I was like, no, I can't, but I can tell you how to walk into a salon and what yeah. you should look for. That being said, um, we're doing this interview because I need to get my hair <laughs> styled <laughs> for my next special. And who doesn't love sunny L.A. <laughs> that decided to look like Detroit? Anthony Dickey came to the West Coast for more. <laughs> it definitely does look like Detroit. Though. It does. It's a mess. Why? Except in your backyard. It does not. Like paradise. Nice. Thank you. I love you. I love you too. Thank you. I'm Jordy. No, I was talking to Dickey. <laughs>